Hi there. This is a commentary on chapter one of Lila to accompany my full reading of the first chapter. So in the second and final novel by Robert Maynard Piercig, we notice some contrasts with his last novels and in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. For one, this is more of a novel, not as much an autobiography that's been changed for narrative purposes, but a situation in which the main narrative of the novel probably didn't happen in the way it's presented. There are, of course, a lot of other parts coming up in the book that did happen, but not so much the main narrative. However, Piercing did have a boat, and he used it quite a bit. Him and his wife, Wendy, sailed hither and yon, and it became like the motorcycle for him in terms of Zen and the art of sailing. And the name of his boat was Arete. Another difference I think that is significant between this book and Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance is in Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, you have a very wholesome situation. You have a father and a son and you have the father's married friends and they're kind of like a family and they ride across America discovering small towns and looking at the topography and there's nothing really R-rated about it. Perhaps you get a PG rating when you, when Phaedrus begins to break down, but that would probably be the extent of it, perhaps some of his dreams. But really, there's not anything that's not quite wholesome uh, in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Not the, not the case in Lila. In Lila, we account a sordidness and we open up, in fact, the book where Phaedrus is waking up with a bar, let's just call her a bar floozy, called Lila, who he picked up the night before, um, having been very drunk, and so had she been. So this first chapter has several themes, and the first one is Lila as an archetype, and so she fulfills the child, the whore, and the goddess archetype, and then there's also if you're going to go Jungian, the element of synchronicity in terms of her relationship with, with Phaedrus and you could even say the notion of anima. So Lila, the child Lila, is innocent and the, the grown-up Lila still resembles her in moments when she's asleep or when the light catches her a certain way, when she's unaware. So she's sort of, in those moments, she's the child she was, the pure child underneath whatever happened to her in life to make her the whore, which is the second archetype, the one that we meet initially. And here she is, the bar floozy, the whore. She's used to picking up men and then trying to figure out how to escape the next morning, you know, navigating her hangover. The third, of course, is, is the eternal Leela, the goddess. And this is, of course, Leela is the embodiment of dynamic creative energy of God that animates the, in, the inanimate and cycles through life and death and goes on its way and that is at play everywhere in, um, in our experience. So a big part of the theme is, let's just say, the synchronicity, you know, the fact that he's seen her on several occasions over the years and she really means something to him. She represents something about the feminine. Let's, so let's just say she has sort of a quality of the anima she has a real stronghold on him, this, this mythic Lila that he's lived with for many years. He reflects upon her being in his bed after being part of his psyche for so long. These half-forgotten images are strange, he thought, like dreams. The sleeping Lila, whom he'd just met tonight, was someone else too. Or not someone else exactly, but someone less specific, less individual. Sounds like an archetype. There is Lila the single private person who slept beside him now, who was born and now lived and tossed in her dreams and will soon enough die. And then there's someone else, call her Leela, who is immortal, who inhabits Lila for a while and then moves on. The sleeping Lila he had just met tonight, but the waking Leela, who never sleeps, had been watching him and he had been watching her for a long time. And so that description does kind of indicate these Jungian qualities to Lila. Often with synchronicity, you know, the way you're, you're going to explain it is when this thing captivates you, the memories, when you have the person in front of you, the memories become much more significant. And so in retrospect, you 
imbue meaning to these memories. And that indicates sort of a pattern uh, of meaning, and that is very much like synchronicity. But as it turns out, he thinks he's met Lila before, but he lived in, in Minnesota. And Lila says she's never been to the Midwest, although she does say a lot of people look like me. So another theme in this book is time and space. And time and space are addressed individually, but they're also interrelated. Time opens up space and vice versa. There's not much time, says Phaedrus. He needs to get south before the cold weather causes trouble for sailing. But he's also running out of time in terms of his life. He's a middle-aged guy and time is passing. And maybe this is what pushes him to act like a teenager in the first chapter of the book. And, you know, why not? What's wrong with that? Well, we'll figure out if there is something wrong with that. He reflects on a situation where a lot of boats couldn't get down the locks. And they're stuck there for a couple of weeks because the locks have to be cleared out. There had been a big hurricane and they can't get down. An unexpected gap of time had opened up. The reaction of everyone at first was frustration. To sit around and do nothing, th that was just terrible. The yachtsmen had been busy about their own private cruises, not really wanting very much to speak to anyone else. But now they had nothing better to do than sit around on their boats and talk to each other day after day, not trivially, in depth. Soon everyone was visiting somebody on somebody else's boat. Parties broke out everywhere simultaneously all night long. So being forced to take time that you think you can't afford opens up the opportunity for depth. So you could say a kind of space, you know, a kind of deepening of the space. All the way to Kingston, this feeling of being connected without barriers to the ocean gave him a huge new feeling of space. The space was really sailing, this sailing was all about. And then he says to Regal, because he's been thinking about this space thing, as Phaedrus is inclined to do, think about stuff. I think what we're buying with these boats is space, nothingness, emptiness, huge sweeps of open water, and sweeps of time with nothing to do. That's worth a lot of money. You can hardly find that stuff anymore. But Regal doesn't buy Phaedrus's assessment of space. There's no space here. It's all crowded with history. It's all dead now, but if you knew this region, you'd see there's no space. It's full of old secrets. Everyone covers up around here. He asked Regal, what secrets? Nothing's the way it seems, Regal said. For Regal, there is no space because everything is crowded with the residue of time, and it's important to see that residue because the past is a force that needs to be acknowledged, according to Regal. He holds it in high regard. His own family has been here in this area since the Revolutionary War and only moved away 30 years ago, about the time that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance was written. That was, of course, a time that was very tumultuous, that tradition and convention was upturned by the revolutionary hippie movement and the anti-Vietnam, anti-establishment movement. So to think there is all this space where there isn't for Regal is kind of, uh, let's just say, irritating to him because to to imagine their space where he thinks there is not there is history would be to discount that history and the past of Regal's family is is part of that history he's very proud of it it's very respectable he's got the DAR cred and besides that his family was very successful at the turn of the century as businessmen so time and space are also indicated in the ties to the land. The space between Europe and the American frontier becomes apparent. As the boat moves south, he's seen a growing aura of social structure, particularly in the mansions that have become more numerous. Their styles were getting more and more removed from the frontier. Things were getting closer and closer to Europe. And that's interesting as well because as, as they move away from the frontier, the space gets more crowded and the space between the frontier and Europe kind of converges on, this, um, on, the, on the East Coast. Now remember this book is called An Inquiry into Morals, so obviously discussing morality is going to be a very big deal. There's a very moral character, and you probably already guessed who it is by his, um, by his pride in the past, and that's Regal. And Regal has this stodgy quality about him. He seems to think in black and white terms. And he indicates clearly that he thinks Canadians are much more moral than Americans. Two of the Canadians at the bar were a man and a woman up against each other, so close you couldn't have slipped a letter opener between them. 
When the music stopped, Feeders motioned to Regal and Capella to notice them. The man had his hand on the woman's thigh, and the woman was smiling and drinking as though nothing was happening. Feeders asked Regal, are these some of your moral Canadians? So Regal has to backtrack. Remember, he has this very black and white thinking, so he has to say, well, all Canadians are moral except for the ones who aren't. There's the Canadians who dislike the junkiness of American culture, and there's the Canadians who love it, who, junk, who love the junkiness and the tackiness. Regal really is kind of caught up in this moral, amoral dichotomy. He's a very, like I said, he's a very black and white thinker. He certainly doesn't approve of Lila, and he's known her for a long time. She's worse than junkie. She's worse than tacky. She's from the sewer, says Regal. So what does that say about Regal's view of sex? And what is he going to think of what Phaedrus is about to do? So another theme is how light describes states of mind and how states of mind are related, how light can get you in a state of mind, or you notice light in a certain way when you're in a state of mind. So here's a map of where he was on the, on the lock. And here's a picture of the lock, so you can get a sense of how chaotic, how hellish it might have been coming down these in the middle of the night and having to navigate them. And just as an aside, you know, one theme in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is the journey is not the map. Well, here's a perfect example of that. The map looks nothing like what you actually encounter with the locks. His chart had shown a series of locks close together, but they didn't show altitude and they didn't show how confusing things could get when distances have been miscalculated and you are running late and are exhausted. It wasn't until he was actually in the locks that the danger was apparent as he tried to sort out green lights and red lights and white lights and lights of lock tenders' houses and lights of other boats coming the other way and lights of bridges and abutments and God knows what else was out there in that black he didn't want to hit in the middle of the darkness or go around either. He'd never seen them before and it was a tense experience. And it was amidst all this tension that he seemed to remember seeing her on another boat. Okay, so you could say that Lila, he, he seems to remember seeing that, you know, what, whatever you want to call it, that feminine figure that is part of his unconscious or part of his psyche. So let's just say she's like a beacon on the other boat. She appears like a beacon in the midst of all those lights, at least in this memory. And the eternal Leela appears as an illumination that radiates from behind the face of our flesh and blood Lila when he's talking to her at the bar. She said, where have I seen you before? A cliche, he thought. God, it was her, the one on the streetcar. She's at, and she's asking, where have I seen you before? And that was what started the illumination. It was stronger toward the center of her face, but it didn't come from her face. It was as though her face were on the center of a screen and the light came from behind the screen. Now you can blame a certain amount of this on intoxication, but I don't think that that's what this means. So she says, where have I seen you before? And then there's an illumination. But that illumination fades as the eternal Leela recedes into the background, that um, eternal anima figure. and and Lila comes forward and manifests in front of him. And this is the real Lila, the flesh and blood Lila. The illumination is gone. This, this new Lila doesn't have any of the magic of the eternal Lila, but she sure is sexy. There are also the lights of the disco function that's attached to the jukebox. We're going to assume it's kind of like a disco ball that along with several cans of ale put him in this sort of liminal state of not knowing or caring or just being and not having any agenda other than getting caught up, you know, caught up in the reverie of dancing and drinking with Lila. Is she the one? Yes. Yes, she is. She is the one. She has been for a long time. She has been in his soul, and now she is in the flesh. Maybe not Lila but Lila tonight. All he could see was Lila and the lights whirling around and around, around and around and around and around, red and blue and pink and orange and gold. And they were all over the room and they moved across the ceiling and sometimes they shined on her face and sometimes they shined in his eyes, red, pink and gold. There's a lot about the lure of sex on a primal level. You could call it biological. And the biological urges rise to the surface 
as the highest quality thing that these two people should do. He studied Lila some more. Her legs were crossed and her skirt was above her knees. Wide hips, shiny satin blouse, v-necked and tucked tight into a belt. Under it was a bus line that was hard to look away from. It was a defiant kind of vulgarity, a kind of Mae West thing. She looked a little like Mae West. Come on and do something, if you've got the nerve, she seemed to say. Some X-rated thoughts passed through his mind. Whatever it is that's aroused by these cues isn't put off by any lack of originality. They were doing all kinds of things to his endocrine system. He had been alone on the water for a long time. Do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight, get down tonight. The biological urges are further enhanced by that song that plays on the jukebox. It seems like a black sermon in its presentation, but it's not a call to come to Jesus. It's a call to get it together. It's an immoral sermon, one that calls people to guilt-free sex. So a question. Are these two middle-aged people finally getting it together after all these years? On the first night they meet each other, is this immoral? The song pervades throughout the scene in the bar as Phaedrus leaves the world of consciousness and, and enters that liminal state we were talking about of intoxication. The music further and further and further suggesting his and their next course of action. So just as an aside, I want to show you a quick clip I found on YouTube, and I'm sorry about the sound quality. <laughs> So that video has over 5 million views, and we have a lot of powerful history behind us as cultural beings, and is very sophisticated and very intellectual, but at the bottom of it all, it's stuff like this for its lack of originality and for its tackiness that captured the attention of 5 million people. So Phaedrus falls asleep at the end of chapter 1, musing on how, if you don't try, sometimes you get what you've been hoping for for all these years. Him, of all people, with his big nose and social awkwardness, ending up in bed with sexy Lila. Will this be a good thing? We shall see. So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next time.